so it's very nice to be back here in person. It feels like it's been a long time. It's nice to see familiar faces, and it's equally nice to see a bunch of people that I've never met, never seen before, which is a good sign that the community is growing, um, and it's a healthy community. Um, so this talk is about building with a beginner's mindset. Um, first, I'll talk about uh, where I work, maybe. Uh, so I work at a company called Subspace. Um, and what Subspace is is a global low latency network for real-time communications. Um, and so the internet really isn't designed for real-time communications. If you think of a traditional CDN, if you're in New York or LA or wherever you might be, you want to go to the pop that's closest to you, the point of presence, so that you can download the static content, whether it's a video or audio file or maybe just some, just a, a web page, so that you can get it as quickly as possible. Um, real-time and real-time communication is a bit different because when once you miss that packet, it's no longer relevant. Like you know, if you're playing a game and you shoot a gun. Once that bullet is out, it's no longer relevant uh, later on in, 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 any, in any sense of the word. Um, so an analogy for what we do is sort of like Google Maps or Waze for the internet. So if you think of going from like LA to San Francisco, you're probably going to take the freeway. However, if there's traffic on the freeway, then you might be rerouted to like state roads or local roads or whatever the case might be. And so we, we take that approach to how we move, how we route our traffic that goes onto our network so it can be quite efficient and we can provide reliability and redundancy that the, that the general public internet cannot. And so for me, I don't have a background in, in, in networking. And so the, when this opportunity came up, it was really an exciting opportunity to learn more about networking. And it was something to do an ideal use case for Elixir as well, because of course Elixir has its foundations in Erlang, which has its foundations in the telecom industry, which is quite similar to sort of how the, how the modern, uh, how the internet works, um, sending packets around, uh, similar to how you would make a telephone call, these kind of things. And there are lots of interesting applications that we uh, have, that we can use the network for. And one of the things that I'm pretty excited about is that soon there'll be a general availability launch so that anyone can sign up, trial out the network, and it'll be really interesting to see what people do with the product. And so the, the most exciting thing about this was that I would get to see how the internet actually works. How do these things actually work? Um, and in the interview that I had, you know, we, we talked about sort of your background and, you know, what do you know about BGP? And I was like, well, I don't know much about that. And it's like, that's fine, you'll learn. And so this is where we'll talk about today. So first we'll talk about what a beginner's mindset is. I'll talk about my beginner attempt and then how experts can come in and help refine a product that, that was created, you know, with a, a fresh perspective. So first with the beginner's mindset. So what is this idea of a beginner's mindset? Um, this is something that has always appealed to me in some way or another, and I'm not really exactly sure why. Um, but I found out that there's a, a Zen Buddhist concept called Shoshin, and it literally means the first character there means beginning, and the second character is heart or, or mind. I mean, the idea is that when you look at something, even as an expert, you're able to see a new perspective on it and a fresh, fresh thing. And I have no idea how I stumbled upon this concept, and I, I liked it because I put it on my GitHub profile for some reason. Um, but th this idea of seeing things with a new perspective from that, and why this is interesting to me, especially I think, is there's a, another book uh, called Changing Your Mind by Michael Pollan. And, it's, and in the book he talks about how as you get older, your neuroplasticity starts to become more, fr more rigid, and, and as you would expect, you, you begin to do things in the same, the same way. Like if you, get the, if you go to the same coffee shop every day, you probably go the same way, you probably order the same drink. And a child, a child's mind, when they see something for the first time, there are all these interesting neural pathways that have, that have to come together to sort of recognize and understand this image. And for older people, you know, as I sort of decline into middle age, um, we, don't, that's, we don't do that. We just have this same pathways. And so being able to take this perspective and try to see things from a new perspective will help at least to maybe, you know, stave off some of that, some of that decline. So, but, what I'm talking about in this case isn't this Buddhist perspective of Shoshin. Um, I'm, it's more about the idea of being confronted with something for the first time. And this doesn't mean like this doesn't mean an absolute beginner. Like you can't pull someone off the street who has no background in coding and say, okay, now I want you to design this system. It's probably not going to, to be a very good product. Um, but however, if you do have you know a certain background and we're saying, okay, now we're going to put you in this perspective that's slightly uncomfortable because you don't know you don't know the answers to these things, then you can get some interesting results. And you know, think about the first time that you engage with something. Like sometimes it will be, you know, apprehensive, or sometimes you'll be excited about it, or sometimes it'll be whatever that reaction might be when you do something for the first time. There's something unique about it. And the reason that we do this is because we want to get unexpected results. Um, 
we allow for exploration. Of course, if you, know, you have to have parameters around this exploration. You can't say, well, you know, go build this and come back in some, some undefined number of weeks or months and we'll see what happens. But having this, this, this controlled exploration can, can come up with some interesting results. And this is really, what this really, uh, our goal for this is really just innovation, right? Like this is how things happen, is when you, when you put people in un uncomfortable, unexpected positions, something good will come out. And there's also a chance that some of the attempts will fail. Like if you look at you know, something like 97% of Stravis fail, um, but it's the same approach. You have this new idea and you wanna see something, something going through it. Um, and then, in fact, like our team uh, for the Elixir side at work, I was the only person who was hired who had any Elixir experience before joining. And so everyone who came into the Elixir side of things also came in with a new perspective. And so they tried to apply whatever domain knowledge they had from other languages to the problems that we had at Subspace and also to apply it using Elixir, which also came up with some interesting results. And the, the first version of the product was created by people who had no networking or Elixir experience before, which is a real testament to how we're able to put these people in this, in this position and to see a, uh, see a successful outcome. And so this is really one of the core principles we have in, in, in engineering at Subspace. And this, while this is an Elixir talk, we use Go and C as well. Those people are also put into similar positions as well so that they can also have these interesting outcomes. And so I don't want to dismiss experts as being useless and quite the contrary. Experts are, are extremely useful. Um, the problem with experts is that they're experts, right? They have spent years or their life's work on research or whatever that might be. And so when you ask them to come up with a, with a solution, then it's probably going to be some based on something that they've done before because it's only natural, of course. Like you're going to want to take the, the, the work that you've done and to be asked to, to look at it from a different perspective can be quite difficult because it essentially challenges you to look at things and disregard what you've spent years or however much time you've been working on that. And experts, you know, in this day and age are somewhat maligned. There are books written like The Death of Experts, and you have the, you know, I did my own research type, type meme stuff online. And this is not, this is not that, like, experts have a place. But it's in, in, this, in this context, the expert's place is later on. And then there is the rare expert. You know, if you take the Shoshin, um, sort of, if you take the Shoshin um, concept, then there are experts who can see things through a beginner's lens. But that's a, a rare quality, and I don't know that I've, really met someone who has fit that bill as such. And so the beginner's attempt, right? This is what I was, the first project I, I worked on when I got hired. And again, like I had no real understanding of lower level network concepts. Uh, most of my background was in like distributed systems or web apps. So, the, you know, it's familiarity with TCP, UDP, you know, IP, but not much lower than that. And so the first project, or the, or as we were building out the, the, the product, one of the questions was, how do we manage the network? And so as you might imagine, um, in order to have like a global network, we have to have many points of presence or POPs, and those have to be able to be managed efficiently. Uh, we had a small team. We still have a, a small team. And so how do we do that effectively? First thing we need to do is we need to be able, is we need to be able to manage the system by hand first. And this was something that we wanted to do early on was because you know, if you look at a network, it's a living thing. It's never really exactly the same at two points in time. There's always things that are changing, things that are coming up and down. Um, and so being able to manage the network first, at least for, to some degree, will, will help you to understand when you automate it later. Um, because, of course, one of the problems with automation is that when things go wrong, it becomes hard to unwind them. So this specific part of the, the network that we are trying to manage is the uh, Border Gateway Protocol, or, or BGP. And specifically, how do we manage our presence on the network? How do we connect to peers, announce our routes, and so on? And if you've been following the news, there was a pretty big incident with uh, BGP last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago. But Facebook uh, withdrew their, their BGP announcements. They messed up their BGP posture. So Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp were, down, WhatsApp were down for a number of hours. And apparently it compounded things worse because also their email was down. They weren't able to get into the, uh, the data centers to physically reset the machines because the data centers were also controlled by the, the 
the locks on the doors were controlled by the same system. So they end up, like, I don't know if this is true or not, but you, know, you saw it on Twitter, so it must be true, right? But they're having to use like, uh, saws and, uh, to get into the, like, literally physically saw into the data centers so they could get to the machines. Um, so thank you, Facebook, for providing some context to what BGP is. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're interested about more details about the Facebook issue, uh, Cloudflare has a great article about it. Um, there are always there are many great articles from Cloudflare about networking and network management. And then, if, you know, of course, the another joke about you know it's, you always blame DNS, but now we have BGP jokes as well. Um, so, how does BGP work? And this is the perspective that I took like as I was learning about how to build this system. It's not, this is not an inclusive uh, description of what BGP is. It's not an expert's uh, perspective of what BGP is, but this was what I needed to learn in order to build the system. So essentially, of course, the internet is a bunch of, a bunch of disparate hosts that are connected to each other. Uh, you have IP, IP addresses and prefixes or sitters. Um, and routers, routers pass the information from each other in order for them to be able to talk to each other. And the prefixes themselves are owned by what is called an autonomous system or an AS. Um, and every autonomous system has an ASN uh, or autonomous system number. And they use BGP to, pass, to, to uh, build these relationships between, between different uh, ASs. And just to give you an idea of how old the BGP protocol is, it was created in 1989, and it's been in use since 1994, so you know, eternities in, in internet time. Um, and just to give you an idea about the number of routes that, that are, exist on the internet and how, how we pass them to each other, there are about 800,000 routes on the internet, and so there's lots of information passing back, back and forth. Um, and one of the, the designs of BGP, right, is that when you announce a route, you want to spread it as quickly as possible. So that can have some unintended consequences, as, as Facebook shows. And I'll show some other examples of that in a moment. And here's some pseudo BGP actions, just to give you an idea of what, what I needed to do, at least translate, to make the, the first version of the system work. So as I mentioned before, you have a collection of IPs, which are prefixes. And you have a prefix length, which if you think of like 192.168.1.1, that's actually a slash 32, which is an individual IP. And a slash 24 is the smallest uh, prefix length that you can do to advertise out uh, on the internet. So this is, you know, if, if you take a look at this from without having any BGP knowledge at, at all, announcing and withdrawing and adding and removing and adding and deleting peers can, you know, reads pretty familiarly to you, and you might think about, well, you know, this is simple. You can look at this through like a REST, REST type API lens or something like that as a way to get a, a coordination point. Um, and then this is sort of how a very rough sketch of how a group of ASNs would work together. Um, so the green circles represent sort of customers on that AS, and then the black lines represent the ways that the ASs are connected to each other. So this is, you know, you would see that the AS on the upper left and the AS on the upper right are connected to each, are, are peered because they have the black line, and then likewise for the, for the other ones. Um, and just to give you some example of some of the ASs, like Sprint, Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, Charter, et cetera, all of these things. And one, and one way that you, like BGP works is that you want to have the fewest number of hops between two destinations. So if you want to go from, I don't know, Tokyo to like uh, Kyoto or something, you would, there, you would want to have the fewer number of hops, but then you can go around for a longer way if, say, that link goes down or something like that. Um, and so that was enough for me to get started to build out this system. And this, but there's one other thing called traffic engineering, and this could be a whole talk in and of itself. Um, so traffic engineering is basically the, the art, because it's sort of a dark art, of making sure that the packets go where you want them to go. And subspace is an anycast network. Um, and anycast means that you can have a single, single IP attributed to multiple service, servers in a network. And so the data is sent based on the closest server based on the location of the request. This is in contrast to unicast address, which is a unique node on a network. And so the thing with 
with traffic engineering or with just generally like pushing traffic to where you want it to go on the internet is that you can have, say, peering with, with relevant providers from, from point A to point B, but you could be pulling in traffic from other parts of the world or you could, uh, traffic could go all sorts of crazy places. Um, like we've seen, you, you advertise some routes and we think it's gonna come in, in like LA and it ends up coming in, pulling in traffic from Paris or Tokyo or all these strange places. And so there are ways to sort of, you know, push traffic the way you want it to go. Um, and one, of the, one concept to do that is, called, is adding communities to your announcements. And so what communities do will tell, tell other ASNs, you know, don't do this. In this case, like, don't export this to other, to other, um, other ASs. And the 6939.0 is another way of, of saying do specific things with this announcement so that you can ensure that things go where they need to go. And this is, as I mentioned before, this is not an exact science. Um, problem is, is that, as you might imagine, some ISPs or ASs don't respect other community values, and so you can send them, so you can say, don't do this, and they'll ignore that and do that anyway. So there's a lot of interesting things you have to do in order to, to get that right, and it's a lot like whack-a-mole in many ways. Um, but eventually you can sort of push traffic the way, the way that it needs to go. And then you might be asking yourself, you know, is how secure is this? And it's a protocol that's almost 40 years old. It's probably not the most secure. And so again, this is a Cloudflare uh, resource. And this is my home AS, which is Charter. Um, and it does not safely implement BGP, um, which is not great, given that you know, Charter is one of the bigger ISPs in the US. Um, and so why, why should you care about you know, having secure B BGP? Um, one of the biggest reasons is called uh, BGP hijacking. Um, and the way, that, that the, the, the way to move forward with secure BGP is something called Resource Public Key uh, Infrastructure, or RPKI. And it's a way of cryptographically signing your uh, route announcements with the originating AS number. So basically you can say like, oh, I actually do trust that this is, this, the information that I'm getting from this AS is, is valid. Um, and like most standards, it's implemented by some, not, not by others, um, and will likely probably never be fully implemented because that's just the way things go. So again, BGP hijacking. So what is BGP hijacking? This is when you can spoof sort of like a man in the middle type attack. And you know, as, as someone who is relatively well versed in safely using the internet or safely browsing or you know, not, going, not getting caught by phishing emails or these kind of things, it was really somewhat unsettling to me when I learned about BGP hijacking because essentially you can, you can have your secure traffic, you can do whatever you want, but someone, if, you're, if the BGP routes are insecure, anyone can take that and impersonate the, a man in the middle type attack to take your traffic and do something, do something malicious with it. And there's a, a number of like, relatively famous incidents of BGP hijacking ranging from almost comical to, to uh, you know, serious uh, results or serious outcome, um, and then like so in, in 2008, uh, Pakistan attempted to block YouTube within the country, but they accidentally took down all of YouTube all around the world. Um, and then in 2014, a Canadian ISP used to redirect traffic, um, and a hacker managed to get in the middle of that traffic um, for about 30 seconds, and they were able to exploit and steal Bitcoin and cryptocurrency mining. Uh, uh, cryptocurrency, um, and then not surprisingly, you know, this is a, a common target also in like 2018. Uh, Amazon DNS were hijacked to steal cryptocurrency, and then in 2017, uh, Russia company Rostelcom um, hijacked prefixes, and it was about seven minutes long. But they were able to intercept the traffic, and it's still unclear whether whether there was anything useful that was that was gleaned from this. But it was still a pretty serious thing to do. So how do we manage BGP? This is again, like this is the ultimate, this is the system that was being built. Um, and with this sort of very neophyte knowledge about how BGP works and what the goals of the system were, we, we embarked on this. Um, and one of the things that we had to do quickly was to get, get it working fast. We have a small team. Um, and so I was basically on my own to do this. I was paired with like a, someone with a network engineer so that they could validate some of these goals and these kind of things. And they were a pretty invaluable resource as the initial um, 
uh, project came together. So the system goals were essentially centralized administration, right? We have like some number of POPs the, at the time, I think it was about 20, and now we're up to about 90. Um, but we can't go around and individually update and manage these, these, uh, these POPs. We need to have a centralized administration of that. Each of these POPs should be independent. One, one POPs error should not bring down another POP. In the event of like a POP failure, we should be able to route around it. Um, we should be fault tolerant, as I said, like being able to, to use this POP independence to be able to maintain um, routing and, uh, and successfully transmitting packets or whatever needs to go. And then lastly, we wanted it to be command or operated so that it could be either a human or another system could be informing uh, the system of what it needs to do in order to change. And so to me, of course, because of my background in Elixir, I saw these sort of as Elixir analogs, right? Like the centralized administration could be a supervisor. All the pops could be gen servers. Um, you know, failure tolerance is let it crash. Like what happens if either the pop crashes or the centralized service crashes? Um, how do we recover from that failure? And then finally, like the commands are just a bunch of messages. And so this was the initial architecture. Um, it looks a lot like an observer application structure with cloud uh, being the, you know, the parent supervisor and then each of the pops being children. Um, you can, and then each of the pops are, are a mixture of different languages. We, have, we, we use three languages as I mentioned, Go, Elixir, and uh, C. And the uh, Elixir, in this case, was sort of an opportunistic uh, uh, approach because we literally didn't have enough people to, to work on the Go side. Um, and so we ended up having to sort of sc scrape together um, pipelines for, Elixir pi uh, for the Elixir pops which made things a little bit more brittle. But it was fine because it, this, this got the system working to where we needed to go. So in this case, you can see um, commands are entered into the cloud infrastructure or the cloud service. And then each of the pops, or the agents on the pop, read, it, read uh, their commands from, from the cloud. And then they apply those to the BGP daemon running on, on the pop. And then we use that to exchange routes and peer with different ASs. And you know, it's, it looks a lot like a supervision structure you would see in the observer. And so, yeah, success, it worked. Um, it was, uh, we were able to manage the, the, the pops that we needed to do. Um, even with this, uh, this initial attempt, we could successfully you know, transform the network, we could redo the network. You know, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that I brought up the community aspe communities aspect especially was because you know, a lot of it in the, the early stages was more about guessing. Well, we think if we make this change to this route, then we'll, we'll expect to see traffic being routed to Paris instead of to, I don't know, like Mumbai. Um, but, you know, it was a lot of trial and error. So, of course, like, it was, succe it was successful, but it, but it wouldn't be a very compelling talk if that was the end. Um, so problems emerged, right? Like, again, like, we were able to manage the network with this, but... A lot of it required, uh, it, was, it was overly complex and there was a lot of sort of this experimentation as part of the initial version of the software that caused um, some difficulty for uh, overall management of the system. So one of the, the, the problems that we had was we, you know, we overly designed the system, right? So here, this is an example of say one pop. Each of these agents are on, on different colors because they were a different type of peer and we thought, well, we wanted to have this fine grained control over these different agents on the system, but what ended up happening was they became arbitrarily defined and overly complex. Um, and you can see also that we have some number of agents running on, on the pop. So for each peering we ended up having, we ended up bringing up a new agent as well. So instead of having one agent and one BGP daemon, we had n number of agents and n number of BGP daemons, which caused all sorts of issues. Um, because we, why, why manage 10 when you can manage one? Um, so maybe these agents would come up and down, maybe they would use more resources on the box. And it seemed like a good idea, but it was just this idea of, of this initial version of the system that had no real clear outcome other than the, the four sort of bullet points I listed earlier. Another error that we made, or that I made, was API complexity. So in the beginning, it was some very simple APIs, like adding, adding removing routes, uh, adding deleting peers, and then when these other things started to come on, um, like uh, these different BGP peer, peer types, um, we started to create all sorts of APIs around them um, and without partnering with the people who were actually operating the system. And part, partially the reason for that was that they hadn't been hired yet. Um, 
And again, like no good definition of done. When is this, when is this project done? So trying to, to show all of these things we could do around the network. And so when we did hire the operators of, the net, of, the, of this system, what they ended up doing was just writing a Python script for the very simple APIs in order to like script the various state changes that they needed to make. So there's a lot of dead code and wasted time. <laughs> and it, you know, overall, overall it still worked, but it was, it, it, the complexity made it difficult to operate. And I think experimentation is quite good in this case. We, after all, the, the initial version of this should be somewhat messy uh, if you're going to try it with a, with a, with a novel approach. Um, and so at this point, like, at the, as a company, we sort of said, like, we've proven the, the product works. We've made a version of it. We understand that there's some complexity in, involved, and there's some things that we could do to make it a lot simpler. And we also wanted to make the product much more general so that it could be used very easily by anyone who might want to use it. So over the last you know, six or seven months, or I guess more like a year at this point, we started to hire people who are much more uh, who are experts in, in their domains, like a lot of people from, uh, for, who had deep, deep experience with network, and, but maybe not as experienced as programmers, so that they could also take this sort of approach from the other side, where they had this expertise knowledge in networking, but they had sort of not as um, refined skills in programming, so we could complement each other in that way. So the first thing you do, I guess, when, when you look at a project that's unwieldy, you want to reduce the complexity of the project. And so using the experience that we had with the operators of the system, we were able to just rip out probably 70% you know, of the code in the system, um, which you know, the best code is no code, right? And this was a time of stabilization and smoothing out of the system. So we were able to take these initial sort of somewhat um, nebulous, or not nebulous, but uh, rocky foundations of the system, smooth them out, and make a solid foundation to build on. Because there's still a lot of work left to do with the system. I mean, um, you know, software is a living thing. What was what was good now might not be good in six months. But especially for a startup, being able to have that initial, being able to run with the initial concept and get it get a proof of concept done and show that it actually works is more important than making a beautiful uh, piece of code. But once that initial work is done, then it comes time to refine it and to make it you know better and and also extend the life of the software by keeping it clean and whatnot. Another thing that we um, worked on was collaborative API design. Um, I mean, this seems obvious to anyone, and it should have been obvious to us as well. But if you're going to design a system, you should probably design the system with the people who are going to use the API. And we were able to, um, to actually get the people who were working with us to, uh, to design the system in a way that made, that made sense for them to use. Um, which means that a lot of the complicated API decisions that we made were thrown away. And again, like this was able to take a chunk of code and, and remove it from the system as well, which is always a good thing. And then one of the other things that we did was have a composable API. Um, when the initial team had built out this wrapper around the API, we realized that you know, why, why should we be building these, these, these two clever APIs that aren't actually going to be used? In fact, when we actually presented the API to the team who was going to be using it, most of them were, were like, this is completely useless to us beyond these initial um, simple APIs. So uh, they were able to build the tooling that they needed to build to operate the system in the way that they wanted it to do. And we were able to push the complexity of the system out to the users of the system and keep the core nice, nice and simple with some very um, simple APIs. And then, of course, as the team grew, you know, I mentioned earlier that we had um, a very small team, and because of the size of the team, we were putting Elixir, which is actually kind of an interesting use case for Elixir, to put it on the pop itself, um, as opposed to being in the cloud, which meant some, uh, some interesting challenges around bundling the software to get it onto the pop, uh, the way we do with our other um, C and Go packages. Um, but the, the problem with that was that we didn't, we didn't have the team to maintain the pipelines for the architecture that was on, the Elixir architecture on the pot. So they ended up sort of decaying, and we would run into all these problems with, with the pipelines when we were deploying the, the software. And as, I, as you may have gathered when I mentioned about BGP, about the various the Facebook issues or, or other issues around BGP, if you, you really need to have testing and things in place so that when you do deploy the, 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 um, the new version of the software, nothing goes wrong. Because 
one of the other things with the internet of, is that in, in, there are all sorts of different routers across the world. There are all sorts of different versions of routers across the world. So if you happen to potentially send uh, like, a, like a, a crafted message that, that is a valid message, there might be routers in the world that don't know how to take that. And if they, if they don't know how to take that and they crash, the problem with that is that these routers, as part of the BGP protocol, is they want to send out this information as quickly as possible so you can take down parts of the internet. So we wanted to make sure that anything that we deployed to the system in particular was very well tested. Um, so the team, as the team grew, we added more Go, Go and C programmers, so it became, it became much more clear that the idea of, that we should use a different language on, on the POP. Um, and so, you know, of course, we write everything in Rust. This is the, the, uh, the, the hip thing to do. Um, we actually did try this as an experiment um, because it did make a lot of sense from, 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 some, from some perspective in the sense that if we were able to, because we could, use, we could write um, uh, NIFs in Rust, we could actually share code between the control plane layer and the data plane layer and not have to worry about you know, keeping two copies of things in sync. Um, but we, it didn't work out very well because we didn't have the support structure to do this. Um, we couldn't just you know, write Rust. We couldn't just take all of our Go programmers and make them into Rust programmers uh, for a number of reasons, not least of which is that they didn't want to write Rust. So this was a, a brief but failed experiment into the Rust ecosystem. Um, so th this is the refined architecture of what we ended up doing. And it looks very similar to the initial architecture, except that we divided the reads and writes of the system. Uh, the, this, the purpose of this system became this is the intended state that we want our BGP posture to be across the network, uh, as opposed to saying, like, this is, this is the actual state of the network. We, this is the intended state. Um, we split the reads and writes, so this became just the write to the system. So we couldn't actually get information about the state of the pops from this system, which was intentional. Uh, it made the system a lot simpler. Uh, we also rewrote the agent in Go, um, which, you know, I think if this were a few years ago, I would have resisted this because I would want everything to be an elixir, but this was definitely the right decision for the team because we had the, more of the networking expertise at this point. We're more familiar with Go than Elixir, although we try to keep our teams somewhat fungible and, uh, so that people can work on different parts of the stack and get exposure to it. Um, and you can see as well is that now there's only one agent and BGP daemon per host, which made things much simpler uh, to understand and to and to predictably measure the load on the boxes, um, because if having heavy load on the boxes can on the pox, on the, the pop boxes can also negatively impact other parts of the system as well. And likewise, if other parts of the system are under heavy load, they can negatively affect this part of the system as well. So this made it a lot easier for us to gauge how the system would behave. Um, and one of the cool things is that we also added like a replayability of the system so that you can actually retrace the entire BGP announcement posture since the beginning of this implementation of the system so we can actually replay it uh, and see how things change over the time. And one of the nice things as well is that when you build out a network, if you have great software and a bad network, it's not, it's not a good product. And if you have a great network and bad software, it's not a compelling product as well. So we started to work much more closely with the networking team so that we could design these things in concert um, and make things uh, more, more effective for everyone involved. And so I mentioned that this is the writing side of the system. This is how we put intended state. So how do you view what the actual state of the network is? Um, there's a thing in the networking world called a looking glass. And this is like a real-time source of routing and BGP um, information uh, for like network administrators. Um, and this is the way that you can see the actual state of the network. And so since most of the people who were working on the administration of the network had been, had been network engineers or net developer, network development people in the past, this was a tool that they were familiar with. And there's an open source version called Alice, Alice Looking Glass. So we were able to use this tool to become the, the view into the system, which made it a lot easier for the network people to use the system. And instead of having to learn a new system, we were able to, to take existing systems and to make them more familiar for the people that, that needed to operate the system. Um, and then finally, like what this is, is collective understanding throughout the company. Um, while this started out as like a beginner's project that I was working on, um, 
we were able to take more people into the company to, to build it and to administer it. And the people who we hire now to administer the, the, the product, as I mentioned earlier, are now the ones who are actually building the product. So we have this foundation that we established, we refined it with the expertise, and then now the people who are operating are also, who have the strong network background and are learning the programming side of things are also able to contribute to this as well. So this becomes sort of a virtuous cycle of getting the, the product uh, working and collaborating and everyone taking part in this, in this system. And one of the nice things as well is that most people on engineering have contributed to this system um, throughout the last couple of years. And so how do you sort of measure whether this is effective or not? Um, one of the measurements I think of an effective use of like system design is how many people, is, is how many people contribute to the system. Like how do you manage to make sure that people aren't, uh, you know, don't have tribal knowledge. And one of the ways that, you, that I mentioned before is that by having different people work on the system, that's a good way to spread the knowledge around. And as I mentioned, most people on engineering have worked on this, on both like the cloud and the pop side. Um, this is sort of a map of our current pop deployments around the world. Um, we're, we're managing all of these with, with this system. Uh, we, this would be a very laborious task if you had to manually go to all of these pops individually and you know, Make, make BGP announcements there. So we're able to manage this network very efficiently and effectively. And also it's still growing quite a lot. So there's a lot of changes that are happening all the time on the network. And if we were having to, to do this without any record of doing so, it would be very difficult because you can make a one change in one place and expect that to happen but without having that historical context to see how the network behaved before and after. It makes it very difficult to optimize the network. And then another view into the, into the network of how sort of evenly dispersed or how densely, densely integrated subspaces with the rest of the internet. This is another BGP for Hurricane Electric, uh, which is one of the older uh, ISPs and one of the biggest ones. Um, you can see that they are number one, in fact, in the number of internet exchanges that they belong to. And subspace is within the top 10 now, um, having surpassed like Fastly and, and some others in there. Um, so the system helped us do this and to make sure that, and to help us get to this point uh, very quickly. Um, and then this is also a, another view of the system. Uh, this is the, uh, this shows the way that subspace is connected to the rest of the internet, to the rest of the ASs that we're paired with. So you can see it's quite a dense map there. And so overall, this has been a successful implementation of the system and we've been able to take you know, beginners and get them experience and then to use the experts to refine that experience and then to continue this with other people that we hired and to continue the cycle so that everyone can contribute to this and, and keep building the system. Um, because of course, like any piece of software, anything you do is going to go through times of building, times of repair, times of decay. And so by, by taking this approach, you're able to expect these, these cycles to happen and to guard against them and to make sure that the product continues to evolve um, in a, in a well-mannered and expected type of way. And uh, that's all, thank you.